thank you for joining this scientific briefing on coastal resilience and nature-based solutions. I am Catalina Lopez of the Institute of the Americas, and I have the pleasure of introducing two scientists who are doing some amazing work that they will be talking to us about. But before we get to that, I would just like to remind everyone that this session will be in English. So if you prefer Spanish, there are instructions of how to get the translation on the chat uh, link below. So please go ahead and click on that. Uh, and you will be listening to all of us in Spanish. And I will also like to remind everyone that there will be, or there is a video uh, related to nature-based solutions also on the platform, on the Whova platform. So after this session, please feel free to visit that uh, link and take a look at uh, some wonderful projects that are taking place here in the San Diego area. Um, so with that, uh, let me start introducing uh, Dr. Jennifer Smith. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree in biology and biological sciences and earned her PhD in marine ecology, marine botany, coral reef ecology and conservation and invasive species from the University of Hawaii. Dr. Smith is a professor of marine biology at Scripps Institution of Oceanography here at UCSD, where she has been working primarily in tropical coral reefs and temp temperate rocky reef ecosystems. As the principal investigator of the Smith Lab, her research focuses on how humans, humans impact marine ecosystems and developing solutions for degrading marine ecosystems. So her recent, recent work includes the use of seaweed as a means of reducing methane emissions in animals. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Smith, for accepting our invitation and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Catalina, for that nice introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with all of you this morning and to share some of this, this research that we're all really excited about. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Thumbs up. Okay, great. So today I'm gonna to share with you some work that we've been doing looking at the potential use of seaweed to mitigate methane production in livestock. So I think as we all know, um, many of the marine ecosystems that we have all come to love and value so much for so many of their important ecosystem service, services, are all equally threatened by the impacts associated with climate change. And of course, climate change is being driven by the burning of fossil fuels and the release of greenhouse gases into our atmosphere, which is continuing to, to drive these, these warming phenomenon. When we think about greenhouse gases, we often think about carbon dioxide. Um, and while carbon dioxide is certainly the most abundant greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, uh, methane is a close second, and methane is important because it actually has almost three times the warming capacity, or sorry, 30 times the warming capacity that carbon dioxide does, such that um, one, um, you know, one kilogram of methane is equivalent to something around 23 kilograms of carbon dioxide. And so methane has a much greater capacity to warm the planet. Uh, making it you know, quite a, a bad greenhouse gas. But the one good thing about methane is that it has a much shorter lifespan in our atmosphere. So methane only exists or persists in the atmosphere for around 12.4 years, whereas carbon dioxide can exist in the atmosphere for hundreds to thousands of years. So this suggests that if we can come up with solutions to mitigate or manage methane, reduction, methane emissions, um, we'll actually be able to have impacts to our climate that we could actually see in our lifetime. So there is a huge uh, interest and lots of incentives to find solutions to methane emissions reductions. So if we take a closer look at where methane comes from, we'll probably, many of us are probably familiar with the fact that most methane emissions, at least the anthropogenic methane emissions, comes from the livestock industry. Um, specifically agriculture and agricultural waste. And if we take a closer look at that, um, most of this is coming from, again, the livestock industry. We have over 1 billion cattle on the planet. Cattle are all ruminant animals and through the process of their digestion, they're releasing methane. In fact, the livestock industry is responsible for releasing an equivalent amount of greenhouse gases as the entire global transportation industry. We're talking about planes, trains, automobiles, and ships. 
And so this is a very significant source of greenhouse gas emissions and something that um, we need to try to find solutions for addressing. As I mentioned, ruminant animals through the process of enteric fermentation, simply as they're breaking down the food that they consume um, through their digestive process, methane is emitted as a waste product. And the majority of this methane is coming out of the mouths of these animals. Um, and you can see uh, spanning different types of animals from buffalo to beef um, uh, to cows, um, as well as goats, sheep, and other ruminants, they're all responsible for a significant amount of methane emissions. And so while the, while the transportation industry has developed solutions for addressing carbon emissions, specifically we can use electric vehicles instead of burning fuel, uh, the livestock industry until recently has not had a viable solution for for, meth, um, for reducing their methane emissions. Um, however, recently, just over the last few years, a number of scientists have been discovering or studying ways in which we might be able to manage the bacteria or the digestive process in ruminants and had been testing a whole variety of different natural products, different types of plant extracts, different types of seaweed extracts, and lo and behold, through this research, they were able to identify one particular species of seaweed known as Asparagopsis taxiformis, which when fed in very small quantities to livestock caused significant reductions in methane emissions. Um, basically, here is our red seaweed, Asparagopsis. And again, when fed very small quantities ranging from a quarter to even um, just 1% of their daily dry matter food intake, we were able to see reductions in methane of around 90%. Um, a number of studies have happened subsequently looking at both um, the beef and dairy industry and results have been consistent. We've seen consistent methane reductions, um, consistent with the dose of seaweed that these animals are being fed. Um, also, in addition to seeing methane reductions, we're seeing improved, improved food efficiency of these animals. So while they're not releasing methane as a waste product, they're actually able to use that um, to generate energy. So they're, they're not releasing this waste product and they're becoming more food efficient, meaning that they need to actually eat less food to achieve the same benefits. Um, further, there's been a number of blind taste tests and there have been no detectable effects on the meat or dairy quality and no detectable impacts on the health or well being of these animals. So, a number of scientific studies have been published um, over the last four to five years, and again, continuing to show really strong and promising results from this seaweed supplement. However, um, the biggest challenge to developing this as a massive commercial industry to feed the greater than 1 billion cows on the planet is access to the seaweed. So the seaweed had never been studied in captivity. Uh, very little research had gone on to developing commercial aquaculture um, strategies for cultivating the seaweed. We knew little about uh, where it exists globally, um, how to manipulate growth rates. And because the seaweed is producing uh, bioactive compounds that are responsible for interfering with the digestion in livestock, we need to, find ways of enhancing those compounds in the seaweed. And so a lot of this research really focusing in on the seaweed and how to basically better understand it to inform the development of the commercialization of the species has been taking place at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and um, in my lab where my students and I have focused on working to identify where the species exists, to collect it from the wild, to isolate it and purify it in culture, and then to conduct a number of different experiments to determine how factors such as temperature, light, and nutrients affect the growth rate of the species. And ultimately, this work is being fed into the development of an, a commercial industry for the seaweed. Um, <clears throat> Ultimately, in order to develop an entirely new industry, especially um, such as this, this particular seaweed in an aquaculture setting, 
um, foundational research needs to be done to identify the proper species, the species that hold the greatest potential for mitigating methane, um, to identify the impacts on the animals, and ultimately to determine how to administer the species in feed on live cattle ranches. Um, and ultimately, we will be measuring the ecological impacts of this methane mitigating solution, both in terms of the ability of the seaweed itself to sequester carbon and also have massive carbon offset potential in terms of its ability to significantly reduce 90% of the methane emissions in this livestock industry, and also measure how that improves the livestock industry and even food efficiency with these animals in the future. So we've made um, great strides in, in navigating this pathway. Currently, there are a number of startup companies around the world that are working on commercialization of this species. You can see them um, scattered across this map here, a few in North America, um, a couple in Europe, um, China, Australia. Um, so there are uh, efforts underway to look into commercialization of this species. It is still not commercially available, however. Um, this is a very new industry. But if we were to take a look at where Asparagopsis exists within the Americas, um, just, just within the Americas, this is a map developed by my students and I, and you can see that Asparagopsis is broadly distributed throughout both the Pacific and the Atlantic side of the Americas um, through Central America and even in South America, as well as throughout the Caribbean and throughout um, all along the coast of Mexico, Baja California, and Southern California. So there is a lot of opportunity to think about developing commercial industry for this species um, within the Americas and to think about how we might be able to take a leadership role in the development of this industry. So we're really excited about this. Um, when you think about, again, how many ruminant animals exist on the planet and the potential that the seaweed has to mitigate their methane emissions, we're talking about a very large number. Um, these animals produce 220 trillion pounds of methane per year. And even if we were just able to reduce that by half, that would be a very substantial number. So there's obviously a lot of increased interest in this product and uh, there will be growing in, uh, increase in demand for the product. So we look forward to seeing this species um, become commercialized and see what kinds of impacts it may be able to have on our climate within our lifetime. So with that, well, thank you and um, look forward to take, taking any questions that you may have during our Q&A session. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, that was uh, a very interesting overview and we'll get into the questions uh, in a little bit. Uh, reminder to anyone, you can please send your uh, questions in the little chat or Q&A uh, sections below, and I'll be monitoring them. And after the next presentation, we'll go over them. Um, so next I will go, uh, I will introduce Matthew Costa, uh, who I've had the pleasure of knowing for a few years now. Um, so uh, Dr. Matthew Costa studied ecology and evolutionary biology at Princeton University. And during that time, he researched coral reef and mangrove ecology at the Bermuda Institution of Ocean Services. When he came over to UC San Diego, uh, he earned his master's degree in marine biology and a PhD at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Uh, and his research took place at the Center of Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation, and he was working on sediment carbon stocks in mangrove forest. So as he continues to develop his research, he is focusing on blue carbon, coastal ecology, climate change, adaptation, and sediment bioge uh, biogeography. So like I said, I've known Matt for a while, so I am very happy to introduce you to him and I'll have him talk a little bit about all his exciting work with mangroves. So uh, take it away, Matt. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Let's see. Okay, you all seeing my screen? Good. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for uh, inviting uh, me to speak with you today. 
Uh, I am going to be speaking to you about blue carbon, which is the topic of my doctoral work at UC San Diego in Scripps and also as a postdoc in the Center for Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation. Um, currently, I'm working on building a baseline data set of blue carbon in San Diego County. Uh, and I've been lucky enough, though I've been lucky enough to study mangrove forests across Latin America during my doctoral work, now shifted during the COVID era to doing more local research, which has turned out to be a great uh, benefit to get to work with local NGOs and organizations and to work on a project right in our backyard during a time when there's so much interest, local interest in using blue carbon to um, motivate coastal management and restoration. Here, here you could see an image in uh, Kendall Frost Marsh here in San Diego in Mission Bay in the center here, I can use this laser pointer. Um, a, a sediment core on the right, this is what a sediment core looks like. Uh, and this is what those samples look like to the naked eye and also under a microscope. And I'll be speaking a little bit about this work today and also trying to address the question, can coastal wetlands help mitigate climate change? I've done this local work in close partnership with the Alberto Lecter and Norris Labs here at SIO, uh, the UC Natural Reserve System, San Diego Audubon, Wild Coast, and many really dedicated students. So what is blue carbon? Blue, uh, blue carbon ecosystems, uh, these are salt marshes, mangroves, and seagrass beds, though they represent only a really small fraction of ocean area, which is just this thin, um, here, I'll use my pointer, this thin bar at the top of the, this total bar, which represents the total area of the ocean. Though they represent a really small fraction of ocean area, um, they really are working a disproportionate amount to, to sequester carbon. The size of these bubbles up here represents the total carbon burial associated with these ecosystems, which is really disproportionate for their, their area in, in the global ocean. There's only about a million square kilometers of these ecosystems of salt marshes, uh, mangroves, and seagrass beds, which sounds like a lot, but in comparison to the whole ocean, that's relatively small. These ecosystems have, have faced rapid ecosystem degradation in recent years, unfortunately. And it's been estimated that if we restored all of those ecosystems back to the level that they had been before uh, the, the history of degradation, that would sequester billions of tons of carbon but that, in fact, still accounts for just about on the order of 1% of the total carbon uh, uptake we need to address the climate challenge. So that is an example of how big the, the climate change challenge is. And it also lets us know that um, you know, this is just one of many solutions that we need to address. Now, that 1% number is just assuming that the carbon sink potential of an acre or a hectare of coastal ecosystem is just one fixed number. But of course, carbon sequestration rates are really variable across and within these different ecosystems. So a, a promising long-term research goal is to find out how we can manage these ecosystems to maximize their rates of carbon sequestration. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So uh, where are these ecosystems? As I said, we have salt marshes in the uh, here on uh, the upper left, seagrass beds in the lower left, and mangroves here in in the, on the bottom. Um, they are distributed throughout the coasts and different parts of the world with mangroves, which is shown in the orange here on the more tropical and subtropical coastlines. Salt marsh, salt marshes in yellow, closer to the temperate zones and seagrass beds found in both the temperate and the tropical zones um, in deeper water than the coastal wetlands. So these are found throughout the world and, and including throughout many of the countries in the Americas. These three ecosystems are called blue carbon ecosystems specifically because they're understood to be the most effective at sequestering carbon, though other ecosystems also are important carbon sinks. I can't talk about coastal wetlands without talking about their biodiversity. Uh, the plants that live in these ecosystems by producing a lot of food and creating diverse zones in which to live are home to many animals, microorganisms, algae, algae fungi um, that bring together communities normally found on land or in the ocean or in the air, all in one place. So it's really a very uh, beautiful and diverse uh, complex environment. 
this is not just beautiful and inspiring, but also represents an important, what we call a co-benefit of blue carbon uh, work. Biodiversity uh, is one of many, represents one of many ways that these ecosystems provide ecosystem services. Uh, they support fisheries, ha habitat for important fisheries species, which uh, is a topic of research in the Alberto lab uh, in which I did my PhD at Scripps. Uh, they also filter seawater, uh, co protect coastal zones from erosion and uh, hurricane impacts, as well as sequestering carbon, which is the focus of my research. And these ecosystem services are, are uh, help support um, eight of the U United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which you can kind of see in the upper left corner here. So this is all to say that it's very important to recognize that not only are these ecosystems important for sequestering carbon, but they also provide really important benefits in terms of a broad range of ecosystem services. So and another important research challenge is to find out how to manage these, these coastal ecosystems to maximize their carbon sequestration while making sure that the, that management style reinforces rather than compromises the, all these other functions. So this is a really promising area for uh, a research to bring make these ecosystems as um, as valuable as possible for uh, in our ally to, in the fight against climate change. So focusing back on carbon, let's put some numbers on this carbon sequestration research uh, on the carbon sequestration service. We can see here on the y-axis is carbon burial rate, so grams of carbon per meter squared per year. This is how much carbon is going into the ecosystem and staying there for long term per year on a per area basis. Blue carbon ecosystems sequester so much carbon, not just because they're highly productive, but because the organic matter that is produced by them and tra is trapped by them uh, gets trapped in accumulating sediments that build up over time and keeps that carbon from returning to the atmosphere as CO2. You can see this difference here in that the, the three ecosystems on the right, the classical blue carbon ecosystems, have a carbon burial rate roughly two orders of magnitude higher than of terrestrial forests. So you can see this y-axis is on a log scale, meaning that these are about a hundred times more uh, faster carbon burial rate than these other forests. Of course, there's also a really big error, there are large error bars here, which gets to the point that there's large variation in carbon sequestration rate, which is one of the motivating research reasons for my research to understand where this variation is coming from. And hopefully we can use this information to learn how to maximize the carbon sequestration potential of wetlands that we manage. To put these carbon sequestration values into a real world context, here we see the, these, the global average rates of carbon burial in the three blue carbon ecosystems. That's this first column here, carbon burial rate. Um, and we'll, so taking, for instance, the rate for sea, uh, salt marshes, 218 grams of carbon per meter squared per year, that's equal to eight tons of CO2 taken up per hectare per year, to put that in a more familiar number, tons of CO2 per hectare. And that, it turns out, equals roughly the emissions of two cars driving around per hectare. So one hectare of salt marsh is canceling out of two cars driving around on the road all year. So what does this mean? Well, it means that these have a significant, they, they take up a significant amount of carbon, they make a real difference, but also that, again, it's not the whole solution. Uh, in this simple example, we need both to increase as much as possible the number of hectares of wetland to it, it cancel out more cars, but we also have to reduce the number of cars uh, emitting CO2. Um, on the other hand, if we destroy or degrade these systems, we're actually increasing our annual emissions in the sense that we're, we're reducing the natural sink of CO2. So in addition to the reduction in uh, gr this gradual sequestration it associated with cutting down or clearing away these ecosystems, the one-time emissions of releasing those blue carbon stores that have built up over many years or uh, centuries uh, can be um, even more a uh, really serious uh, impact. So sequestered carbon forms deep deposits of peat over time. Uh, these cores on the upper right show a single site in Baja California in Mexico 
uh, where we have very deep sediment deposits going down about three meters. So that represents thousands of years of stored carbon. And this is what those samples look like, really rich in organic matter. So if we disturb or destroy that ecosystem, you're essentially letting all that carbon go back to the atmosphere that has taken hundreds or thousands of years to build up. So this really adds up. And as you can see in this graph down here, which estimates the current rate at which these three ecosystems are being lost globally uh, and the total amount of carbon that is threatened by that, that that loss amounts to billions of dollars of damage. So this is a really important way, another important way to think about these ecosystems, not just as potential net carbon sinks, but if we, if we protect them, we're preventing a really large carbon source to the atmosphere. So it's very important to both protect what we have and to restore more systems. So to get into a little bit of the work I've done on this topic in my dissertation uh, it, in mangroves around Latin America to see how regional variation in two environmental factors shaped the variation in carbon stocks. We sampled in four areas, which were the Galapagos Islands, the, both the Caribbean and the Pacific coasts of Panama and in Baja California, or the Baja Peninsula in, in, in Mexico. The literature suggests that rainfall, annual rainfall is a predictor of carbon density. So how much carbon is stored per cubic centimeter in the sediments, uh, which is an important uh, component of carbon stock. And also that the history of recent relative sea level rise might be a predictor of sediment depth. So how just how much sediment in total is present in uh, underground. So we examined how these two variables which vary across this region might be might be helping control these two controlling variables in carbon stock. Uh, and it was an opportunity to go around to all these amazing places and I sampled 80 sites across these four areas during my dissertation, taking sediment cores producing hundreds of samples to, to analyze their carbon content, to construct estimates of their carbon stocks. So what did we find? We found that the variation in carbon density was lower than the variation in carbon stock. So in the left, you see car the coefficient of variation, which is just how variable those data are for carbon density. It's relatively low compared to the, the next graph, which is the variation in the sediment depth, which is much higher across all those regions. So this tells us that sediment depth controls most of the variation in the total amount of carbon in these ecosystems. And as a result, there is variability across these regions in their carbon stocks with relatively higher carbon stocks in the really much more tropical sites in Panama than in some of the drier uh, environments in the Galapagos and Baja Peninsula, though it's important to recognize there's pretty big range. They're out, you know, the samples that are pretty low in each in each region and some that are exceptionally high. So this variability is actually very exciting, uh, represents an exciting opportunity to understand where this variability is coming from and how can we take advantage of that to maximize the use of the, the carbon sequestration in these ecosystems. So doing my postdoc in the last three years here locally in San Diego, the goal has been to build a baseline data set of carbon sequestration and stocks in wetlands around the county, San Diego County. And I've been doing this work in close partnership with Wild Coast and with San Diego Audubon and other, and other partners. Uh, and our, so this here in the bottom right, you can see one of our sites. This is Famosa Slough, which as you can see, it's a small wetland surrounded by urban development, which is kind of the theme of this work here is how much carbon can be packed into these small and impact and human impacted sites in Southern California. We do our field work by using this, you can see in the center that's me using a, what's called a Russian peat corer, which is a metal apparatus we use to take sediment cores. And on the left, this is us having opened a sediment core and you can see the sample, the core inside, we take samples at different depths to understand the carbon content and then cycling in those samples. And that's what the samples look like in the upper right. You can see little pieces of brown plant matter. This is a sample from more than three meters deep in Famosa Slough in California. And there's still visible pieces of plant matter. And so this is showing how well-preserved organic matter buried in these sediments are. This really shows how carbon takes a one-way trip into the ground in these environments and stays there very well-preserved, which is really what makes them these ecosystems special. 
So what have we found? Uh, this work is ongoing, but some initial results we can share is that, uh, well, so we've been building a data set in addition to the one site where there was pre-existing published data on blue carbon in the, in the county, which is the, in the Tijuana River estuary. We've added three more estuaries so far to that data set. And some initial data we have for some, I'll give you some vignettes on some of the information we have, which includes that at San Diego Lagoon and one restoration site, we have really high accretion rates of 14 millimeters per year, which is higher than average, but relatively low carbon stocks, which represent, which indicates the fact that this site has the sediment accretion needed to bury carbon. Sediment buildup is a necessary part of the carbon sequestration equation. But the carbon sequest the carbon stock that's there is is below, uh, well below the global average for salt marshes, and so this this shows that there's a potential for more sequestration, but it's not currently being met. In Kendall Frost Marsh in Mission Bay, we've found uh, an analyzing carbon stocks in a few of the cores we've taken across the site a pretty large range already in carbon stocks just within this small. 16 hectare site rate of carbon stocks ranging from 152 to 370 tons of carbon per hectare, which if you scale that up to the whole site mean represents 2000 to 6000 tons of carbon across those 40 acres or 16 hectares. Uh, and this just represents the need for local data because this below ground landscape at the site is highly variable. And to understand that better, we need to capture that variability. So we actually have many more cores that are currently being analyzed for this site to, to understand the, the true variation in carbon stock and to use that to inform the work that the city is doing, the planning work the city of San Diego is doing to decide how much salt marsh restoration to do in this part of the bay in the coming years. Finally, as I mentioned, we've been working in Famosa Slough, which is this tiny, uh, small member of the California MPA system that is surrounded by de coastal development, but has in some places really, really deep sediment deposits, more than four meters deep that uh, are, have blue carbon stored in them. So this just shows how even small, heavily impacted coastal environments can have really uh, large amounts of blue carbon potentially. So what can we do with this information? Uh, it's very important to know what we have, what, what, re what blue carbon resources we have in order to protect them, to know where they are. And we need to build just baseline data to understand how as we do more ambitious blue carbon projects in the future, how we can, what, we're, what we have to start with and where we're going from here. There are a lot of challenges that need to be uh, addressed just in terms of getting access to the, for stakeholders to get access to this information. There's, there, uh, there are many roadblocks along the way. So promoting uh, statewide systems for reporting and capitalizing on blue carbon value is one of the, will really stimulate progress in this area and lowering the barriers to entry for smaller stakeholders to get feasible, make blue carbon projects feasible. So to close, I just want to consider again this big question from the beginning, can coastal wetlands help mitigate anthropogenic climate change? To do so, let's consider what we can accomplish by conserving and restoring blue carbon ecosystems. I've marked this diagram from McLeod et al. Uh, with these red, to put in red the arrows that represent fluxes of carbon due to people. So we have movements of carbon through these different systems from ocean to the atmosphere to plants and then fossil fuels uh, moving carbon into the atmosphere. So these red arrows are the things that we're doing, deforestation and fossil fuel combustion. So to, to map on to this diagram what we can do with coastal wetlands, Conserving them represents preventing more loss, right? It represents pre preventing more loss of carbon from the vegetation into the atmosphere. So that's what that little red line blocking the deforestation arrow is. So it's sort of stopping the bleeding, preventing more emissions due to lo uh, losing those ecosystems. Restoring degraded ecosystems is undoing some of the negative impact we've already had. It's turning back a little bit of this deforestation arrow, undoing some of the deforestation damage by restoring those ecosystems and bringing some of that carbon back. But we haven't actually done anything about the red arrow in the upper right, the fossil fuel arrow. To counterbalance that, we need to have a new arrow in a sense, or a new, a new uh, true negative emissions has to come from doing something beyond undoing the damage we've done to coastal ecosystems. And that represents either expanding beyond the original footprint, the area of those blue carbon ecosystems, or finding a way to increase their carbon sequestration. 
So I think these are two two of the really important areas of research uh, remaining for blue carbon research is to understand uh, can we manage these ecosystems to, to increase the rate of carbon sequestration per unit area? Because increasing the total their total area is greatly limited by sea level rise and coastal squeeze with coastal development. So what can we do to increase the rate of carbon sequestration in a in a given area of coastal wetland is an important area for the future and applied long-term research and systems for integrating data across sites are really necessary to help answer these questions to make it possible to use our coastal development to best effect to fight climate change. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, that was very interesting. We already have a few questions trickling in on the chat, uh, but also on the Whova platform. Uh, we do have about 12, 15 minutes to address some of the questions. And I would like to start with a question or a couple of questions that I'm going to combine into one for you, uh, Dr. Smith. Uh, and it's regarding the scalability of uh, this uh, seaweed and, and producing and farming the seaweed. Um, and you actually touched and you have a, a really nice figure uh, with the steps of, you know, how you start with the research, but then you also work with industry and then um, the, the, the different steps, right? Um, so can you build a little bit on that process, that experience as a scientist, what it's been like to really go through the entire process of discovering something and then uh, trying to, you know, use this and, and get people on board as a solution. Uh, it's, it's amazing to think that such a, a small and delicate little algae can, can have such great impact. Uh, but also if you could uh, also talk a little bit about what the implications are of uh, producing large scale or having large scale farming for uh, such a, uh, an algae. Uh, and an additional quick little uh, question that I'm going to throw in there is, are there any other species that we know of that could also contribute to this um, effort? Yeah, hopefully I can remember all of those questions, but if not, you can uh, re-prompt me. Um, in terms of working on the project, yeah, when I first began working on this seaweed about three three and a half years ago, you know, there was very little research on the seaweed itself. And so while all of the scientific studies had focused on the livestock and the implications and the effectiveness of using seaweed supplements on livestock, um, the, the marine biology side of the field had um, largely been un, untouched. And so it's been really fun, exciting working on trying to develop, you know, how, strategies for cultivating the seaweed. Um, it's been challenging, of course, because we don't ever just develop a new agricultural industry overnight, you know, with wheat or corn or sugarcane or soybeans. It's, uh, these are industries that take hundreds of years to develop with, through strain selection and uh, disease resistance and all of these things. So we are actively still working on that. And I think the research will certainly need to continue to go on in parallel with the rapid development of commercialization, just because there's so much interest and there's a really strong need to reduce methane emissions um, with a lot of policy in the US and in California in particular, I think it's only gonna become more and more um, important. And so, yeah, it's been also interesting working and collaborating with business partners. So I have been working with a startup company and helping them get some of their commercial operations off the ground. Um, most of the industry partners that we have worked with and talked with are really receptive and interested in using this supplement because they're all searching for ways to make their industry more sustainable. Um, and so I haven't seen really any negative interaction aside from, of course, people are worried about how much it's going to cost. And we're hoping that the cost will be offset by the improved feed efficiency that the animals have by feeding on the supplement. Um, it will also likely be subsidized in many places, especially in the early days of adoption. Um, 
so yeah, in general, it's been it's been really interesting, really exciting um, to see all of these different disciplines coming together to try to rapidly build this this into a commercial industry. Um, in terms of, I know the last question you asked was, are there other species that are potentially effective? So in some of the early studies, um, the scientists had been screening many different species of seaweed, um, in addition to terrestrial plants and other, you know, um, other potential supplements. There has been research into even chemical engineering of compounds to essentially do the same thing. In all of the work that's been done to date, there has been nothing that has come anywhere close to asparagopsis. So, um, and the, the attractive thing about using this red seaweed is that it's so potent in its anti-methanogenic properties that you really only have to feed a very small amount. So even though other seaweeds might have the same types of bioactive compounds, they're in a much smaller quantity. So you would have to feed animals much more seaweed to get the same benefits. And there are additional challenges and problems associated with doing that. So it's really attractive from that perspective. What was the second question? I think I skipped over one. Uh, it was uh, about the, the process of working through, you know, with industries and, and other scientists and how to make this uh, a commercially viable. And I think you did touch a little bit on that, but if you have something to add, that'd be. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of interest. As I mentioned, there are startups working around the world in different locations, but really given the potential uh, impact that this, this solution has, it's surprising that there aren't more and at least, you know, groups working in uh, scattered kind of equally across the globe working on developing solutions because ultimately I don't think we're going to have the same cultivation strategy, the same aquaculture set up for this species in every place around the planet, simply because some places will be more conducive to open ocean aquaculture, whereas others will be much more conducive to land-based um, tank aquaculture. And so I think, um, yeah, there's still growing interest and growing need for doing experimental aquaculture. So yeah, lots of Lots of work to do, but it's definitely very promising. Perfect. Um, I'll jump to a question for you, Matt, um, and uh, this regarding a little bit of if we think of, um, and by the way, I love that both of your presentations uh, touch on efficiency in different ways. So, um, so I think that that's something that we need to uh, keep in mind. And with that, when we think about healthy ecosystems, it's like saying they are working efficiently, they're regulating themselves. So in that sense, Matt, uh, your research regarding the distribution of that blue carbon in the sediments, we know that there is a difference in how mangroves or wetlands are storing that. How does that information feed or what role does it play in terms of how do we approach conservation or restoration projects? Um, and is that data or what can we do so for that data to be readily available for people working, non-scientists working in trying to recover and restore and protect all these ecosystems? Yeah, thank you for that question. And uh, yeah, I think that is, that is a really important question because so many groups right now are in the last few years and are really racing to restore their coastal ecosystems and to use blue carbon as a way to motivate that, that work and to try to say, okay, we're not only are restoring 10 acres or hundred acres of wetland, but we are sequestering this many tons of carbon. But to know that you need to know what is the rate of carbon sequestration not uh, in, in that varies from region to region and also in restored sites perhaps versus natural sites. And so I would say that the most important thing we could do to work toward to a really science-based approach to that is to do uh, as much in these restoration attempts to do as much data gathering as possible and to, and to establish connected uh, monitoring of those restorations over many years, 
blue carbon is a slow process. Carbon sequestration is a slow process. It takes place at the rate of sediment buildup, which is very, very slow and imperceptible, it seems, to the naked eye. And so following these projects from year to year and from decade to decade uh, is an important way for us to learn what, what's worked and what hasn't. And in Southern California, there are you know, several projects popping up and you know, well, certainly salt marsh restoration has been going on for a long time and also experiments to find out what the role of adding sediment. So it's called thin layer deposition, which is a way of adding sediment to a restored marsh to increase its buildup. So making sure all of these different uh, studies are being, the data is, is available for everyone and is being uh, connected through uh, in the context of blue carbon is a really, really important goal to as quickly as possible, give people the tools to make their coastal restoration projects as effective as possible for, for blue carbon, because it is true, there is a lot of variation from site to site. So um, it, it's a good start to use published data on similar sites to estimate what your blue carbon impact will be of your restoration, but there's, um, there's always more to know and we have a lot to learn on how to make these projects as efficient as possible. So getting those data shared is, is essential. Definitely. Um, and we have a few minutes left, but I will ask, uh, I know uh, Dr. Smith, you already answered a question, but Matt, if you could take a look at uh, the questions on the chat, uh, if you could uh, just go through quick answers. Uh, yeah. But I would also, uh, before we go and kind of uh, as, a, as a wrapping up of ideas, uh, and again, thinking of how do we scale up and how do we take what we know of natural marine and coastal ecosystems, uh, thinking that when they are pristine or healthy, they are pretty good at regulating themselves. So why, what can we do to increase the public's awareness of, uh, of this uh, role of the healthy ecosystems? Uh, how do we, as also scientists, you can take this opportunity to, uh, you know, let other scientists know what we need to do in terms of, you know, helping improve or finding solutions to great challenges like climate change. Uh, but also, how do we take the opportunity to integrate or incorporate the participation of people? How do we increase collaboration? How do we uh, add local knowledge? Uh, and, you know, how do we make this collective effort stronger so that no matter what community, what country we're in, uh, you know, we can address all these uh, issues and help uh, improve or create uh, resilient communities. So whoever wants to take a stab at it first, I know it was a long winded question. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, and it's inherently a, a critical question that encompasses, you know, all of the different dynamic stakeholders aspects of, of maintaining and ensuring that we have healthy marine ecosystems for the future. Um, so I, you know, there's not one solution. I think communication, education, outreach um, is is the way to ensure that um, that we're all working together. Um, I think some, uh, you know, from a scientific perspective, some of us are so motivated by the impacts that we've seen associated with climate change that we feel like we have to develop some solutions now. And that's where my my personal research has kind of pivoted from documenting impacts and trying to understand the intricacies of how climate change and other global change impacts affect marine ecosystems to we got to do something and we've we've got to do something now and that's where um, I've become you know really focused and interested on finding solutions so definitely personally I'm interested in working with all different stakeholders and um, yeah ensuring that there's open communication and for the particular solution that I mentioned, you know, it has the potential to be an entirely new industry, developing new jobs in coastal communities and places where there may not be um, a lot of opportunity to make a revenue. I mean, think about all of the coastline along Baja that's right next to where Asparagopsis grows and thrives abundantly. And um, so there could be potential for, you know, generating 
a lot of revenue in places that potentially had not uh, seen opportunities in the same way. So um, yeah, just a couple of thoughts there. <clears throat> Matt, final thoughts? Yeah, well, I, uh, well, I, I absolutely agree uh, that fortunately, coastal wetland restoration is something that people can get their hands on, so people can understand it and they see it in their backyard. People who live near the coast and who uh, live alongside or even in some way depend on coastal environments uh, if their livelihood is related to the ocean can see, they know better than, than we do or anyone does, you know, how protecting and, and restoring those ecosystems lead to, leads to more sustainable, resilient coasts. And so the, I think the challenge with blue carbon in, in particular, and this actually relates to one of the questions that Jose asked, uh, thank you, Jose, is, you know, do coastal communities with more mangroves sequester more of their fossil fuel carbon than ones that don't? And the answer is, of course, yes, coastal communities with wetlands, with, with mangroves and other wetlands sequester more carbon, but that benefit is shared across the world. So the atmosphere mixes very quickly. So if you're sequestering carbon, in one area of one part of Baja, that benefit is kind of shared equally around the world. We're all getting the same climate change uh, reprieve from that impact. So you have to find ways of, to reward coastal communities for their, for their sustainability projects um, for things that we all benefit from. And so the whole world benefits from reducing climate change. And so, that, so I think the two approaches to that I endorse are connecting to the co-benefits, so the, all the other ecosystem services that restoring an acre of coastal wetland provides, but also for give, empowering local stakeholders to benefit from the carbon sequestration associated with local projects. And so that requires uh, systems that, you know, reward, you know, that provide funding at the local scale and to local stakeholders with ownership of that those projects to benefit directly from restoring them and sequestering that carbon, and that that will require a lot of a lot of work and a lot of co cooperation. But uh, ultimately, that's where this the rewards of doing you know if we're talking about carbon credits or on the carbon market, you know, how, getting the that those rewards back into the hands of local stakeholders who actually can interact most uh, most frequently and well with those coastal ecosystems is, has got to be the way forward. So empowering local stakeholders. Yeah. Right. Well, unfortunately, we are running out of time. And I need to hand over uh, the session to our next uh, panel, which is on drought and water management. So please make sure to log on to that presentation. I would like to thank Dr. Smith and uh, Dr. Costa for accepting this invitation uh, and encourage everyone to uh, continue exploring their research. It's wonderful and it's amazing what these two um, projects are achieving. Uh, also reminder, there's case studies for these uh, sessions today on the Whova platform. So make sure to uh, click on those and, and take a look. And again, uh, join us also tomorrow and Friday as we continue this uh, conversation. Uh, with all our of, of our invitees. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Smith and Dr. Costa for this and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.